Well, hello. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrew Taylor, and I am the Manager of Technical Support for Services here at Sekasui Xenotech. Today, I'm going to be giving a brief presentation on our in vitro DDI drug transporter studies that we offer at Sekasui Xenotech. So first, what are drug transporters? Drug transporters are membrane-bound proteins that prevent or assist in the movement of drugs into or out of cells. Drug transporters are found in all cells throughout the body. However, when we consider uh, DDI for drug transporters, we're mainly concerned with several different tissue types, including the intestine, the liver, the kidney, and the blood-brain barrier. Now, there are two main superfamilies of drug transporters. The first are the ATP binding cassette transporters, which are also called ABC transporters or efflux transporters. Efflux transporters use the energy from the hydrolysis of ATP to move compounds from the inside of the cell to outside. The main efflux transporters are PGP, BCRP, BSEP, and MRPs. The second main superfamily of transporters are the salute carrier transporters, or also called uptake transporters. Now these transporters do not require ATP and are responsible for moving compounds from outside of the cell to inside. Some of the main uptake transporters are OATP 1B1 and 3, OCT1 and 2, OAT1 and 3, and MATE1 and 2K. So why are drug transporters important? Well, drug transporters can be thought of as the A, D, and E in ADME. They're responsible for drug absorption, distribution, tissue-specific drug targeting, and also elimination of compounds. Because they're involved with so much movement of drugs and compounds, they can be involved in many DDIs. The clearance of transporter substrates can be impacted by transporter inhibitors or inducers. And this can lead to toxicity or loss of effic efficacy of a given drug. One real world example of this is statins. Now statins do their function in the liver and require the hepatic uptake transporter OATPs to enter into hepatocytes. Cyclosporin is a potent inhibitor of OATP transporters. So, if you're taking cyclosporin and statins at the same time, and cyclosporin is inhibiting the OATP transporters and therefore the uptake of statins into the liver, you can see a large increase in statin exposure. And this can lead to toxic side effects such as rhabdomyolysis, which can eventually lead to kidney failure and possibly death. So as I mentioned earlier, drug transporters are found in all cells throughout the body. However, when looking at different tissues, we tend to focus on certain types of transporters. For example, when considering the intestine and the blood-brain barrier, the efflux transporters, particularly PGP and BCRP are important because they regulate the absorption or entry of drugs into the brain or into the cells to the intestine. When looking at the liver or kidney cells, the uptake transporters are important to consider because they remove compounds from the blood. And also the efflux transporters, and in some cases other uptake transporters, are involved in pumping those compounds, compounds out into the bile or the urine for excretion. The regulatory guidance has very clear recommendations on considerations when evaluating transporters for DDIs. The FDA, EMA, and PMDA generally overlap in the nine main transporters that should be investigated. These include the efflux transporters, PGP and BCRP, along with the uptake transporters, OATP 1B1, 1B3, OAT1, OAT3, OCT2, MATE1, and MATE2K. The regulatory guidance also recommends that other transporters should be considered as necessary, including BSEP, MRP2, and OCT1. With regards to evaluating the test article as a substrate for particular transporters, all the regulatory agencies recommend that PGP and BCRP substrate potential should be evaluated. 
The substrate potential for other transporters should also be considered based on the clearance and elimination routes and or knowledge of other drugs that are in the same therapeutic class. For example, if the clearance of the compound is 25% or greater through a given elimination pathway, the transporters within that elimination pathway need to be considered for substrate potential of the compound. For inhibitor evaluation, the regulatory agencies recommend that the panel of nine main transporters be investigated. In addition, the induction of the transporter PGP needs to be considered if the compound is a known inducer for CYP3A4 or for the PXR or CAR pathways. Lastly, any metabolites of the parent drug need to be considered for potential transporter interactions if the metabolite is 25% or more of the parent drug AUC. So here at Sekasui Xenotech, the general definitive design of our transporter studies is designed to meet the requirements of all the regulatory agencies. For all transporter studies, we keep the concentration of our solvents at 0.1% and we try to try to avoid going greater than 1% of solvent. For all of our tra definitive transporter studies, we include all of the preliminary experiments that are recommended by FDA guidance and these include cytotoxicity, stability of the compound in the media, and non-specific binding of the compound to the experimental plates. The main design of our inhib transporter inhibition studies involve keeping the probe substrate concentration much lower than the KM, using a short incubation time to keep within linear range while still obtaining acceptable fold uptake of the probe substrate. The concentration of the test article is kept at the highest concentration based on EMA and FDA guidance recommendations while still considering cytotoxicity and solubility limitations. And our definitive design experiment includes seven concentrations of the test article, plus a no solvent and solvent control in order to determine IC50s. Additionally, we offer a minimal design experiment, which is a medium throughput design, which has two concentrations of the test article, along with a no solvent and solvent control. And of course, all experiments include the appropriate positive controls with the specific positive control substrates and specific positive control inhibitors. For our transporter substrate assays, we keep the concentration of test article at a pharmacologically relevant concentration, while keeping in mind not to have the concentration so low that the compound is then below the limit of quantitation or so high that it sub saturates the transporter making evaluation of substrate potential difficult. Now, as I'm going to get into in a minute, we have three basic designs of our experiments that depend on the transporter that's being evaluated. And these are the transwell uptake and vesicles. For all three of these study design types, we offer two different versions of the study. The definitive design includes four concentrations of, of test article with three time points, with or without inhibitor and control cells. For all these, we also offer a minimal medium throughput design where we look at one concentration of the test article, again at three time points and with and without inhibitor. The design of the vesicle assays is the, si is the same as the uptake design. However, it is, includes uh, treatments with and without the cofactor ATP. So as I mentioned, the experimental design will depend on the transporter that's being evaluated. For example, when looking at the efflux transporters, PGP or BCRP, the experiments are conducted using a transwell assay experimental design. Now the transwell assay is shown here in this diagram, and it can be thought of as a cup within a cup with a polarized monolayer of cells grown in between them. Now this creates a basal section and an apical section on either side of the monolayer of cells. Compound is added either to the apical side or the basal side, and the efflux of the compound in either direction is measured. For substrate assays, we measure the bidirectional permeability of the test article across the cells in both the A to B and B to A direction. 
For inhibition assays, we measure the effect of the test article on the bidirectional permeability of a known probe substrate for the given transporter. Now, the test system used also depends on what transporter is being evaluated. When looking at PGP, we either use CACO2 or MDCK2 cells. And for BCRP transporter, we use MDCK2 cells as the test system. When looking at SLC or uptake transporters, we use our uptake assay design. In this design, the test system used our HEC-293 cells that are grown in cell culture plates. For substrate assays, we measure the accumulation of the test article in transfected and control cells. While for inhibition assays, we measure the effect of the test article on the accumulation of a known probe substrate for that given transporter. And again, all experiments are conducted with the appropriate known probe substrate and known positive control inhibitors. The last type of assay are the vesicle assays, and these are generally used when evaluating BSAP and MRP2, and sometimes PGP, transporter substrate or inhibition. Vesicle assays, the test system consists of an inverted plasma membrane of vesicles that's made from cells that are overexpressing the transporter of interest. Again, for substrate assays, we're measuring the accumulation of test article inside the transfected vesicles. Now, since vesicles are not whole cell systems, they require the addition of the cofactor ATP. So treatments are also included with and without the ATP cofactor. For vesicle inhibition assays, we measure the effects of the test article on the accumulation of a known probes, probe substrate again in the presence and absence of ATP. Also, when evaluating kinetics of efflux transporters, vesicle assays are the preferred method. Now, this is an example of some results from a PGP inhibition experiment. On the y-axis, we have our different treatments with our no solvent and solvent control, and then different concentrations of the test article, ranging from low to high. The x-axis shows the apparent permeability of digoxin, either in the basal to apical direction, shown with the dark bars, or the apical to basal direction, shown with the light bars. Now, by slightly rearranging this data, looking at the efflux ratio of digoxin, either from the B to A or the A to B direction, and comparing it to the solvent control, we can calculate an IC50. So this is that same data rearranged how I just described, where the y-axis shows the percent of control of the efflux ratio of digoxin as a function of an increasing concentration of test article. When plotted this way and fit with a line, we're able to calculate an IC50 of the compound to the PGP transporter. Well, I know that this slide here can be a little bit difficult to read, I wanted to incorporate it just to illustrate some of the many other transporters that we offer for study here at Secasoe Xenotech. Aside from the nine main transporters that are recommended by the regulatory agencies, we have numerous other transporters that you may want to consider for your study needs. Depending on the different routes of elimination or absorption of your drug, you might be interested in testing many other different transporters. A full list of these can be found on our website under the Drug Transporter Services section. Lastly, aside from the many drug transporter services that we offer as studies, we also offer a number of products that you can purchase to conduct transporter studies within your own lab. These include test systems, such as primary human hepatocytes, either in suspension or plated, and also primary animal hepatocytes. Along with the test systems, we off, also offer numerous support reagents to go along with these. So I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. If you have any questions, please get in touch with us through the Contact Us tab on our website. Also, please contact your regional account manager if you're interested in placing a contracted drug transporter study. Thank you very much.